Hello everyone. Welcome to the third installment of our ReConnect webinar series. I am Alexandria Nemoylan from the Leuven Centre for Global Governance Studies at KU Leuven, and I will be moderating this webinar on the rule of law crisis in the new member states of the EU, the pitfalls of overemphasizing enforcement. With a panel including some of the top experts on these matters, as well as project partners of ReConnect, Professor Petra Bard, Professor Dmitry Kochinov, and Dr. Barbara Grabotska Moritz. Yeah. Petra is visiting professor at the Legal Studies Department of the Central European University, and her research focuses on EU constitutional law and EU human rights issues. She also provides training to judges and prosecutors in a program sponsored by the Council of Europe. Among her latest articles is Saving EU Criminal Justice, Proposal for EU-wide Supervision of the Rule of Law and Fundamental Rights. And she is also co-author of a recent study on disinformation and propaganda, impact on the functioning of the rule of law in the EU and its member states. Dimitri is Professor of EU Constitutional Law at the University of Groningen and has published widely on comparative EU citizenship law, principles and enforcement of EU law, and EU external relations law. In 2018, he co-edited the volume on reinforcing rule of law oversight in the European Union with Carlos Klosser. And among his most recent articles is a paper also co-authored with Petra Bard, entitled The Last Soldier Standing, Courts versus Politicians and the Rule of Law Crisis in the New Member States of the EU. Last but not least, Barbara is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Groningen and an expert on the functioning of the justice system, the implementation of the right to fair trial, rule of law, as well as the functioning of prosecutors and security services in Poland. Thank you all for joining us today. Great pleasure. Thank you. Before we start, just allow me to say a few words about the ReConnect project for those who are not familiar with our uh, project ReConnect is a four-year multidisciplinary research project funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program. It brings together 18 academic partners from across Europe and aims at reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. The goal that we have set ourselves is to explain and provide solutions to the deepening disconnect between the Union and its citizens in the context of recent crises, such as the challenge of migration, the economy and security. As for the general structure of this webinar, first of all Petra and Dimitri will present for approximately 25 minutes. This will be followed by Barbara's comments and a brief response from our speakers. During the presentations you may send your questions to me via the webinar chat box which you can access from the control panel where you will also find today's presentation available for download. After the presentations, I will then bring your questions into the discussion and allow Dimitri, Petra and Barbara to respond. It's now my great pleasure to give the floor to Petra and Dimitri and I very much look forward to their presentation. Petra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alex, for your kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again with you, Reconnect Partners today, and with the wider audience. Um, today, I'm going to address four topics. The first is the situation on the ground in countries uh, which have a record of clear rule of law backsliding. Um, second, I will list the arguments that they invoke in order to deny that this is actually happening. Third, I will look into um, the EU values versus the rule of law backsliding in the uh, problem children member states, so to say. And finally, I will argue against EU inaction. So let me say a couple of words about foster children of the uh, European family and of democratic transition. These two countries are Hungary and Poland that I'm mentioning today, not because all other member states are immune to rule of law problems in the European Union, 
but we have singled these uh, countries out because um, in a very well documented manner, in a systemic manner, they dismantled the rule of law, democratic principles and fundamental rights. But this was not always the case. After the regime change, Hungary and Poland were the first post-communist countries to join the Council of Europe and to abide by the European Convention on Human Rights. Hungary and Poland established official relations with the NATO and the European Union already in the early 1990s. And in 1999 and in 2004, they joined these entities respectively. Now, the EU played an important role in the transformation of all Eastern European states and in the context of their democratization. The principle of conditionality was used to achieve this, coupled with the presumption that once a member state, always a member state, or in other words, there was a presumption that any democratic or rule of law backsliding would not be possible once the transformation was in place. Now, history proved this presumption wrong. The shift came rather abruptly in Hungary when in April 2010, in a free and fair election, the center-right political party Fidesz and its tiny coalition partner, the Christian Democrats, got 53% of the votes, which translated according to the election law then in force into more than two-thirds of the seats in the unicameral Hungarian parliament. Now, interestingly, um, constitution making was absolutely not on the agenda at the time. Nevertheless, this was one of the first steps that the Fidesz government took. And I think the procedure is important in, in many respects. Um, uh, the old constitution had a requirement of a four-fifth majority to draft a new constitution. Now, the government didn't have a four-fifths majority, so the first, one of the first things they did was to get rid of this four-fifths majority by the two-third majority requirement, because for constitutional amendment, you only needed a two-third majority. So once this supermajority requirement was not there in the constitution anymore, a new uh, constitution called the fundamental law was drafted. Public sentiment was very much in favor of a referendum. However, um, the uh, government didn't take this risk. Uh, rather, it sent out so-called national consultations to the people um, in order to gain their support. Um, now, national consultation is basically a list of questions prepared by the government for the people, and the questions were extremely guided. Like, for example, do you wish to see the rights of future generations in the constitutions or you don't care about this? Some of the other questions, they clearly violated Hungary's international obligations, such as do you want to have life imprisonment without the possibility of parole embedded in the constitution or not? And some of the questions were simply nonsensical, such as do you want to have parents given extra voting rights on behalf of their children? Now, 11% of uh, the electorate returned these letters, um, so it, um, it wasn't really decisive. Um, and uh, in seven days, the, constitution was, 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 uh, the new constitution was drafted and it was adopted. Now, this um, means that the new fundamental law had neither been adopted on the basis of a broad consensus of the political parties, nor did it gain support ex post by the electorate. It has been adopted against the ignorance of the majority population and the firm opposition of those who actually cared. Now, this procedure kind of foretold the substance and what was going to come. The fundamental law that entered into force in 2012 and the cardinal supermajority, two-third majority laws together with ordinary laws were used in order to give rule of law dismantling a veneer of legality, a semblance that everything is happening according to the laws and the constitution. Um, <clears throat> now, this, um, um, the situation was very similar uh, five years later in, in Poland when the Law and Justice Party entered into government. One of their first um, <clears throat> steps was to attack the Polish Constitutional Tribunal and, um, uh, and they captured the, the judiciary. Um, in many respects, uh, it was a copycat of, uh, of the Hungarian approach towards illiberal democracy. Um, however, 
Still, we cannot say that there is a Central Eastern European or even a Visegrad pattern of rule of law backsliding for various reasons. Uh, let me just um, state the, the legal reason first. Um, the Law and Justice Party in Poland doesn't have a constitution amending nor a constitution making majority, so they have to change the system through the back door, so to say. It also um, results in the fact that whatever the Polish government does uh, in dismantling the rule of law is much more visible, it's much more brutal, uh, because this veneer of legality is not always there. Second, whereas the um, Hungarian government, it turned from, a, a, or, or, the, um, or the main party in the Hungarian government, uh, the leading party turned from a liberal party to a nationalist party. It used to be very much anti-Russian, and now one of the main role models is, is Mr. Putin. So, and and the government still manages to maintain uh, public support. Um, in in Poland, they consistently follow a certain worldview, and this is um, the trademark of Mr. Kaczynski, de facto ruler ruler of Poland, which is repolonization. So repolonization for him is a purging exercise, um, which is underpinned by a new worldview, rewriting the democratic the transition and the post-1989 Polish history as something fundamentally corrupt and poised by foreign interest in contravention to national ones. In the exercise, in this purging exercise of repolonization, seemingly all means are allowed, even if they contravene the rule of law or democracy. Now, interestingly, um, the governments, even though they label themselves as illiberal regimes, they do not accept the fact that they are entering into rule of law backsliding, and there are several techniques to deny any such claims. Um, one of these claims is an invocation of national sovereignty. In the Polish judicial purge case, the Polish government claimed uh, that the organization of the judiciary is solely a member state's matter and the European Union shouldn't have a say whatsoever in this, um, in this exercise. Also, in another case where they started the logging in a, in a Polish forest, which is basically the, the last um, uh, primeval uh, forest in Europe, um, the, the claim of the government was that we are talking about Polish land here, so the Polish government, the Polish state can determine what happens on Polish land, irrespectively of the fact that the forest in question was a UNESCO World Heritage Site. A somewhat more sophisticated version of this just because we said so, argument is an invocation of constitutional identity. And here I invoke the Hungarian uh, Constitutional Court's decision um, with respect to the European Council decision on supporting Italy and Greece in the refugee crisis, where uh, the Constitutional Court, the Hungarian Constitutional Court said that constitutional identity equals the constitutional self-identity of Hungary. However, tautological this sounds. What they said is that constitutional self-identity is nothing but the text of the constitution, the preamble of the constitution, and the elements of the Hungarian historical constitution. Now, this very much sounds like an attempt to grant a carte blanche type of a derogation to the executive and the legislative from Hungary's obligation under EU law. Also in 2018, the concept of constitutional identity was embedded into the Hungarian constitution. Third, there is a neo mccarthyist labeling of virtually anyone still capable of formulating dissent as a foreign agent. Um, for example, in um, an amendment to the law on higher education, uh, which is mainly a law targeting the Central European University, um, the, in, in the explanation of the law, um, the lawmaker inserted a reference to national security without any further explanation, so we don't know how the faculty or perhaps the students of the Central European Uni University would be a national security threat. Also, in a law that is labeled as lex NGO in the literature, targeting civil society organizations and harassing them. Uh, the government clearly invoked um, an anti-terrorist legislation and also in the rhetoric it built 
on the assumption that migrants of all sorts are somehow related to terrorism and anyone who is trying to have the rights of asylum seekers enforced are complicit in one way or another in uh, terrorism. The fourth technique the autocrats use to undermine the rule of law is this information or misinterpretation of the laws and policies of the government. Here again, Hungary took the lead in 2011 when the very controversial fundamental law was adopted. They originally sent a wrong and much more EU friendly, EU law friendly translation to the, of the law to Brussels than what the actual Hungarian text said. Um, now, the situation in light of EU values is worrying. Uh, according to Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union, um, the, which is the constitutional foundation of European integration, democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights are overarching values which the member states are supposed to share with each other and also with the European Union, and these are values that, that they are supposed to promote. Now, these values are not respected anymore in Poland and Hungary, and this is very well documented by international organizations such as the Venice Commission, the OECD, or the Reason Commission's proposal from 2017, triggering Article 7 procedure against Poland, or um, the European Parliamentary Resolution of 2018, also triggering an Article 7 one procedure against Hungary. Uh, according to the 2019 World Justice Project Rule of Law Index, Hungary is last uh, in its cluster in terms of the rule of law. And according to Freedom House, which um, puts member states into three different, uh, which puts states into three different clusters, namely free, partly free, and not free countries. Um, so this Freedom House report, in the very first time in EU history, downgraded the member state, namely Hungary, from a free country to a partly free country. And here I quote from the report, Hungary's state is declined due to the sustained attacks on the country's democratic institutions by Prime Minister Viktor Orban's Fidesz party, which has used its parliamentary supermajority to impose restrictions on or assert control over the opposition, the media, religious groups, academia, NGOs, the courts, asylum seekers, and the private sector since 2010. So as a consequence, today the EU harbors member states, which was clearly not qualified for union members, membership if they were to apply today. Um, meaning um, from poster children, Hungary and Poland turned into problem children. Now, the origin, according to the original meaning of poster child, it's a child with a, with a particular illness or disability whose photo is depicted on posters to raise awareness or funds to fight a given illness or disability. So the cases of Hungary and Poland should be warning signs for the EU as a whole. Um, Quoting from two Reconnect partners, Professors Kim Lane Shapley and Laurent, Pla Laurent Pesch, the values crisis of the European uh, Union doesn't seem to be the most urgent one, but it has the most far-reaching implications for the European project. Um, because without common values, there are fewer reasons for the EU to exist in the first place. So whenever Europe fails to act, it fails to act at its own peril. So it's the whole of Europe that is in peril and perhaps in greater peril from those who tolerate or encourage evil and rule of law backsliding than from those who actually commit it. And in this spirit, I hand over to Professor Dimitri Kochanov. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's, it's a great delight to be here and to, to be able to share some observations with you. Uh, Petra has outlined the, the whole story in a spectacular way, as she, as she always does. Uh, so what uh, I will focus on is not the national aspects of our story, but the, but the EU side of it. And I think the... Well, let's start with the EU side of the story. And the EU side of the story is really disturbing, as Petra has already outlined, because uh, the European Union suddenly has discovered that it's, uh, it's, it's failing its member states on a grand promise that it has given. And that, that grand promise was a union of democracies, which actually uh, will function smoothly and will allow all the member states to prosper together. Uh, so I would like to turn to Professor Sadurski's work first. In, in, in his recent talks with the University Press Group, 
Professor Sadowski argued that there are several uh, different reasons why member states would actually join the Union. And one of those reasons, of course, is prosperity and, uh, and, and the development of the internal market. We could probably associate that reason with, so with the UK accession or the accession of Denmark or Sweden. Uh, and the other reason, the initial one, was of course the, the building of, of the peace project together. And this is something more that, that, that appeals also to Central and Eastern European states, because what those states wanted is a membership of a club that can also eventually protect them from themselves. And in this sense, the EU was perceived as an additional check on what, uh, what the, the, those states are uh, doing in terms of, in terms of uh, continuous states with, uh, with functioning democratic, uh, democratic systems. Uh, so the, the perception on the ground in Hungary and Poland, it seems, has been, and that's, uh, that, that seems to be the argument of, that Professor Sadowski has made, uh, that uh, if something goes wrong, uh, precisely what we see in Hungary and Poland now, the European Union at a certain point will be able to intervene so that the values of the EU are not merely proclamations, what Petra ended up with, but also enforceable uh, parts of the EU's rule of law. And the values have a long story in the European Union uh, in, in the sense that, of course, there was always a presumption, and we, it's an open question but whether it's naivety or the grand design by the founders uh, whether that presumption is justified, that all the member states are functioning democracies based on the rule of law. And the, the, the first time when, when values occur in the, in the actual debate on the EU law uh, is, when, is when Jacques Piscator uh, publishes his first, uh, his first monograph on the, on the first enlightenment of the European Union. And there he questioned whether uh, the member states should be bound by the objectives of the Union and by the uh, and, and, and by the basic development of, of, the Euro, of the Union legal system. What he had in mind, of course, is the UK, Denmark, and, uh, and Ireland joining, joining the Union only to block the future development. So the main focus of EU values was on the supranational level, not on the, not on the national level. And the, the main focus of European Union law guarantees was also at the supranational level, uh, not at the national level. And when we move to the national level, we move to the, the, to the discussions surrounding the Big Bang enlargement. And Professor Maresco has written, has written a lot on conditionality, Professor Lyon, uh, other colleagues. And what they suggest is that uh, the EU has been very, very, very scared of, uh, of being joined by uh, the legal systems, which are not on the same page in terms of values. And for that reason, uh, it designed some additional additional, additional instruments uh, to ensure that uh, that values play an, an essential part in the context of uh, of the pre-accession developments that lead to the accession of, of the formerly uh, socialist states in, in, into the European Union. And what we see is basically what uh, Professor Clover described as uh, not willing to go to bed with bad guys. Uh, and uh, a lot of resources was uh, was put uh, towards this towards this aim, and ultimately uh, we can we can actually state at this point I think well, quite soundly uh, that uh, that the, the the returns on the investments uh, are, not, are not really there because uh, all the pre-accession strategy, the the, the the Copenhagen criteria all the idea of checking the rule of law in democracy in Poland, Hungary, uh, the Baltic states, uh, Slovenia, etc., all the states that, uh, that exceeded, uh, was only having one thing in mind, to make sure that current Poland and current Hungary never happen in the European Union. But there is another lesson besides, uh, besides the failure. failure. And, that, and that lesson is, uh, that unfortunately the key of the union, which is the hardcore legal part of what the European Union is about, is not about the values. Because uh, of course the first, uh, the, 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 the first thing that all the member states have to, have to comply with when they apply for membership is, uh, is, is to agree to, uh, to accept all EU law. And uh, all, all, the, all the new member states uh, quickly, quickly came to this realization. What, what happens next is that the EU itself realizes that uh, their law 
does not, it does not in fact include binding requirements of democracy and rule of law. This is simply not uh, what the internal market was about and what, not what, what, the, what, the EU, what the EU legal order was about at the moment. That's why uh, we have the Copenhagen political criteria formulated in 1993 uh, when, the, when the member states, together with the institutions, uh, uh, demanded that all the new exceeding member states or the member states to be comply with the, the, the basic requirements of democracy, of law and human rights protection. This was simply not part of the binding law. Uh, so uh, what was expected by the member states like Poland and Hungary when they applied for accession was that uh, those, that kind of binding law, which is the law on values and which was supposed to get articulated, would actually serve as a safeguard uh, for their own democracy. But unfortunately, uh, as, as we have seen from the overview on values, uh, this is not what the legal system of the Union uh, was, uh, was able to provide. And uh, we cannot say that there are no tools at all. So, of course, the member states were very weary of the fact uh, that uh, this Copenhagen moment happens at the moment of accession. And then, uh, well, what, what scholars uh, term this Copenhagen dilemma is, uh, is, is the day-to-day -day reality in the EU, when you can demand a lot in terms of values, democracy, the law, law, human rights protection of those who are ready to accede, but then suddenly all your powers, the powers of the union, evaporate on this, on this matter exactly on the date of accession. Uh, the only two countries which, uh, which don't follow this pattern are Romania and Bulgaria, where we have the cooperation and verification mechanism in place. But uh, the literature teaches us that probably it's not the most effective way of uh, making sure that, that the values are indeed observed. So what the member states have done uh, during and as, for, as a follow-up of the, of the Big Bang enlargement, they, they were in, in reaching the instruments and the treaties, and especially Article 7. Uh, Article 7, uh, which has been described in detail by, uh, by many colleagues, especially Professor Besseling in the, in the recent book, which I created with Andres Yaka, that's a spinal contribution, and then Professor Sadurski in a famous article in the, in the Columbia Journal of European Law, uh, was first designed to act on those who absolutely fail in terms of democracy and the law. And when, when that article was first tested, uh, was the famous story of uh, FPÖ in, uh, in, in Austria, uh, when the member states seemed to be unhappy with the electoral results in the country. So uh, the article itself, the provision in the treaties that was supposed to enforce the values, didn't have any kind of uh, any kind of element in it that would go against the country or that would allow the union to go against the country, uh, which threatens the values. The only the only option in Article Seven was uh, to go after someone who has who has breached uh, the values already. And then, unfortunately, when when Austria was de facto bullied by other member states without any legal basis whatsoever. Uh, and when the union decided to send uh, the, the, the three wise men to Austria to investigate whether Austria has actually breached anything or not, the three wise men came back saying there was no breach. So, so the EU has kind of lost face twice. First, by, pre by producing the Copenhagen criteria, saying you have to comply with these wonderful values, uh, while at the same time sending the message that since the criteria were needed, the values were not actually part of the binding law. And secondly, uh, by pulling Austria without any legal basis, only to discover that, in fact, the basic conditions of the type of Article, of, of, of the, of, of the article 7 were not actually complied with. Uh, so uh, ultimately, a new instrument kind of emerged, an ad hoc instrument of dealing with extreme cases when Article 7 doesn't work and when there are no other options, you can simply use ad hoc political pressure. And this is something that, uh, that, that worked in Austria, but this is not fully in line with the rule of law. And then if we go to the internal market law, something the, the, the most well-known part and the most uh, uh, reliable part of the new law, of course, 258, 260, 259, uh, these are the provisions which allow, uh, which allow the member states, but also the commission, to go after those who don't comply uh, with, uh, with the treaties that don't comply with the EU law. And here the big question is, uh, 
So what does this mean? Does it also extend uh, to the areas which used to be the areas of the Copenhagen criteria, or does it not extend outside of the scope of EU law, census stricto, the scope of EU law, which is the law of the internal market? And here, plenty of uh, plenty of proposals were tabled uh, in how to deal with this issue. Especially, Professor Shetley has made a fundamental contribution on rethinking Article 258 uh, in in the sense of trying to capture. Uh, the rule of law and, 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 and democracy backsliding by, uh, by accumulating a number of uh, significant violations, which would, which, which would well, they were taken by one, one by one, uh, be viewed as ordinary micro, probably significant departures uh, from, uh, from the letter and the spirit of EU law. So by accumulating different, uh, different infringements, we, we obviously can, uh, can create a game changer. And this is something that Advocate General Tanchev now seems seems to be referring to in the in, in the most recent opinion and in Commission versus Spawn case, etc. Also, 259 can be used in exactly the same in, the, in exactly the same way. But most significantly, among the available instruments, and this is something that is inspired by the pre-accession techniques as well, the pre-accession conditionality uh, relates to, it is something that relates to cutting the funds uh, that the, the, that the backsliding member states receive. And of course, we remember that over the last budget recycle, uh, Poland and Hungary were the recipients of exorbitant amounts of money. We, we, we speak about uh, more than 80 billion for Poland and more than 20 billion for Hungary, which amounts to a visible percentage uh, of the GDP. So these are the, these are the most usual, usual tools mentioned. What is clear is that the problem, however, goes much, much deeper uh, than the tools that we have at hand. Uh, because what we're speaking about when we speak about hunger especially at this point is, is, is the necess necessity of a regime change and we when we need to change the regime it's 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 obviously uh, something that is overwhelmingly more costly than a micro percentage of the, G of the gdp or a couple of cases in front of, of the court of justice and here professor kellerman's work is of fundamental importance where he demonstrates that within democratic federations we can have a situation emerging when uh, when uh, some parts of the Federation are not democracies run in accordance with the rule of law anymore. And he had the southern US states in mind. And still the Federation as such will, 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 will do nothing. And uh, a political forces at play at the federal level will, will actually exploit the, 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 the problems uh, that, that, that occur in, in, in the, in the uh, bad states as it were. Uh, but to give, uh, to give a slightly positive ending to my presentation, I would like to draw your attention to the Court of Justice's breakthroughs in terms of extending the scope of, the, the scope of EU law uh, in order to ensure that it also covers the, the values of the Union. And this is something that uh, scholars have been arguing for, uh, for many, many years already. So uh, there, there is a small booklet I edited for Cambridge with Carlos Closer. Uh, where several scholars, Kim, she Kim Shepard, but also Christophe Virion uh, and others, have demonstrated that there is a logical, legal possibility, uh, without any treaty change, uh, to extend the scope of EU law, the scope of binding EU law, uh, by, uh, by a number of provisions uh, to cover what is now covered by Article 7. And of course, Article 7, even the use of Article 7, doesn't exclude the, the possibility of uh, triggering 258 or 259 infringements, and this is something that what the uh, Advocate General Panchi also agrees uh, also agrees with uh, in his opinion I just mentioned. So what the court uses, the court uses Article 19.1 on courts uh, in order to in, in order to ensure that uh, what is now in Article 7 is within the scope of EU law. It works it, it works ideally well because the, the court allows for the intensification of horizontal dialogue since. Now, member states' courts outside of Hungary and Poland uh, can now block the, the recognition of, of judicial and other decisions uh, coming from the problematic states, citing the, the, the problems with, uh, with, with the judiciary in those states, and also the vertical dialogue. And the, 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 the quintessential example of, of how the vertical dialogue works after the, the most fundamental cases of, of the last year, especially the, the Portuguese judges, is uh, it's all about the references from the Polish, from the targeted Polish courts themselves, especially the Supreme Court, going to the Court of Justice 
asking the Court of Justice to help. It, it's all very great, but uh, but actually the, the main problem still remains. Uh, once you change the regime, it's, ne it's necessary to ensure that, uh, that that regime change is fully endorsed by, by the people on the ground. And here we need to deal with disinformation, we need to deal with with the issues of uh, sociological legitimacy of, of what is done in order to uphold the values. And uh, Professor Blocker has, uh, has pre produced a, a lot of amazing work on this. Uh, also in the, in, in, in the second book, which you see, uh, which you see on the slides. So I, I invite you to look at the two books and also uh, to think about whether there is any room for optimism for us. Uh, I would say based on, based on uh, the, the consideration of all the fact factors at play, probably yes, but uh, but not too much, since at this point the Court of Justice seems to be uh, the only institution of the European Union that is actually strongly active, uh, seeking new ways to have uh, to to or to offer the way out from the current impasse. Uh, so there is some uh, there is some hope for uh, for improvement, but it's not too strong. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, Petra, Dimitri, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. And I'll suggest that uh, we give the floor to Barbara, who can kick off uh, the discussion and then move on to the Q&A. I would like to also remind our audience to send us your questions so that I can uh, feed them into the discussion. Barbara, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me and see as well? Absolutely, yes. Wonderful, thank you. So, so thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me to take part in this um, webinar. I think what we have seen today is a kind of um, trying to um, join two aspects of the rule of crisis. First of all, presenting um, the main patterns that are common to all those backsliding um, states, meaning at least as far as now Poland and Hungary, and those common um, features, as was mentioned by um, by Petra, was referenced to national security, to sovereignty, to constitutional identity, and use this kind of notions in a way that caused really um, um, big trouble at the at the level of the of the EU law and EU um, institutions. But also, what I think seemed to be uh, also quite obvious output from that pattern is that it might be really difficult for the EU institutions to trace those um, those uh, rule of law um, issues. But I also have the feeling that some of the possible um, solutions have been presented both by, by Petra and by um, and by Dimitri. Uh, I guess a really interesting point uh, was made in, in the papers, a paper published recently by both of you, meaning the last um, soldier standing, when you mentioned that what has to happen in in, in future is uh, to actually the, the values need to be upgraded. And I'm really curious. I guess it's a question for for both of you. How do you think how this upgrading um, process can um, can look like? What needs to be changed in the text of the treaty? How the constitutional practice needs to be changed if we really want to see that the, the, the values are really uh, upgraded. My second point uh, refers to one of the last points made by, by Dimitri, meaning this kind of sociological legitimacy um, a crisis as a kind of problem that we have to deal not just meaning that the law is not enough, you have to, um, you have to also look at, um, at the kind of sociological trust in, in, in the rule of law. And my question is, is there any room, in fact, for EU to create uh, or to support or to face this kind of crisis? Imagine that the member state, for instance, Hungary, is already a, an illiberal state, as it called themselves. So the question is whether it's really possible to, um, to deal with this crisis at the EU level with the support of EU institutions when there is no, in fact, rule of law binding state anymore. And my last point deals with the kind of personal criticism um, against use of Article 7, for instance, meaning that it's been used in an unequal um, way. Um, so the idea was to create a kind of monitoring mechanism 
um, that would cover all the member states, and then we would like kind of solve the problem of you know, in a, an equal treatment of member states. And recently, just a week ago, the the, um, the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe says that the EU should actually use the mechanism and tools available in the Council of Europe in this system of law, and not actually not create a kind of new uh, additional instrument which would create some kind of double standards instead of um, creating or sustaining one level of rule of law and democracy uh, protection. So my question would be, could you comment on this resolution? Do you think um, it's, a, it's a good idea? Should, should member states um, sort of listen to parliamentary assembly or rather create this independent monitoring mechanism at the EU level? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, Petra and Dimitri, you can both come back in. Uh, Barbara, you're still sharing your screen. Perhaps we can go back to the presentation slide. And you can leave your camera on. On? Oh, okay. Petra, you can go ahead and start answering uh, fairly briefly so that then we can go to the Q&A. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, for these interesting questions and very relevant questions, uh, Barbara. Uh, I see the European Union as a form of militant democracy. So whenever all internal forms of militant democracy in the country fail and there are no uh, fair and free elections uh, to change the government, uh, so a, so a country doesn't even satisfy the thinnest understanding of the rule of law. In this case, there are the external mechanisms, uh, I think, including the EU mechanism. Um, but also we should acknowledge that from the EU's perspective itself, um, it's an internal protective mechanism to do something against rule of law backsliders because of otherwise, because of the proliferation of rule of law backsliding, the problem will uh, just um, um, move uh, to other countries and, and, and other states will also be uh, infiltrated. Uh, you are right in saying that there were several attempts to come up with an EU rule of law scoreboard uh, that is EU specific and that monitors the problem and I, um, I, I know you uh, you, you, read, uh, you read our writings on the topic and we have discussed it earlier um, at several occasions, but uh, indeed I'm very much in favor of the parliamentary resolution of the European Parliament that came out in October 2016, where they, um, uh, where they urged the Commission to come up with a piece of legislation that would ensure an objective um, uh, context-based qualitative analysis of all member states exactly because the problems that we are discussing here are not only uh, there in the two member states that we have discussed as illustrations uh, but but all member states are um, affected to, to one way or another so if there was a mechanism a, a regular perhaps annual mechanism to check uh, the state of rule of law democracy fundamental rights and other values that the eu and the member states are supposed to share we wouldn't have to wait for rule of law backsliding or gross human rights infringements to occur in order to determine via the eu's respective legal procedures uh, that there are violations of these eu values also, the EU wouldn't have to wait for the external players, and this directly answers your question, because it's not only the EU, uh, the, the Court of Justice's procedures that are slouch, but uh, the Strasbourg st procedures are even slower than the, than the Luxembourg procedures. So um, one would have to wait until some problems essentially become mute in order to uh, to find the remedy in front of um, Council of Europe organs, for example. Also, um, the EU claims to play a pioneering role in the exportation of European values, uh, whereas the Council of Europe in, incorporates 47 contracting uh, states, some of which have a very poor rule of law and human rights record. So why couldn't the EU 
uh, come up with higher standards than the Council of Europe. And my final um, and very legalistic argument is that the Council of Europe is not there to take uh, EU uh, law principles uh, into consideration. So there is a consistency challenge there because whenever uh, fundamental rights or the rule of law are assessed by these European institutions, they have to assess them also against the principle of autonomy uh, or the principle of primacy of EU law or mutual trust. And these are all principles that the Council of Europe doesn't take into consideration. They don't even have the mandate to take them into consideration. So it needs to be an EU specific mechanism that balances all these values uh, that the two of us were talking about. And of course, it doesn't mean that the EU has to reinvent the wheel. No, it can rely on already existing um, uh, mechanisms and databases. But the qualitative assessment also has to include an EU law element, and this is only an EU, EU entity that is capable and that has the mandate to do this exercise. Let me, let me jump Dimitri, in. Dimitri uh, may I say just very briefly, because we have a lot of questions from our audience, so we can quickly move on to the Q&A. Go ahead. So I do just, uh, just one uh, micro point and in terms of upgrading the values, I think it's not the values themselves in substance that need to be upgraded, because uh, however weak the, the Council of Europe seems to be, uh, and the Special Defense Commission, it, it provides it probably provides the backbone of standards, and those are the standards that the European Commission and other institutions also respect. But what we're speaking about is moving the values as much as possible within the uh, within the material scope of European Union law, and this is exactly why the recent case of the Court of Justice is so fundamentally important. Uh, where the Court of Justice is using 191 as a trigger of uh, moving the values within the scope through the, through the idea that uh, the, the rule of law means that judicial independence should be safeguarded at all the level and uh, all levels in the EU. And uh, the Court of Justice is, is precisely the institution that can, if necessary, police that. So the main problem with values and the main problem that needs upgrading is not the substance of values, but where the values are located for the scope of the law. So the more values we have uh, within, within the scope of the renew the key, uh, the, the easier it is for the institutions of the union uh, to react to rule of law and to democracy violation in the member states. Excellent. Thank you very much. I will now move on to some of the questions from our audience. In a first round, we have uh, Claudia Huttner, who asks, what are the key institutions at uh, the EU level that should act uh, in terms of preserving and preventing, well, preserving rule of law and preventing uh, backsliding? Uh, Dan Radulescu uh, suggests instead that we should have, have in the constant of the EU uh, a number of conditions uh, in terms of rule of law and, and democracy, similar to the EU currency zone that are automatically triggered when member states move away from this context. What are your thoughts on, on this kind of mechanism? And finally, uh, Stephen Kutz um, agrees with Dimitri on the positive note with regard to the uh, strength and role of the ECJ and, and a more interventionist role in, 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 in the area of rule of law backsliding, but on the other hand, also uh, expresses some concerns with regard to um, democratic institutions uh, giving extra powers, uh, as it were, to, to a, a non-elected body and the risk of victimization of uh, populist governments. Go ahead. There's a spectacular question, so would you like to start that, or should I? Just go ahead, please. Okay, and, uh, let's let's start with Stephen. Thank you for asking the the splendid, the splendid question. Uh, in order for democracy to survive, it's absolutely necessary to, to make sure that the democratic institutions, the democratic institutions, once elected and stopped by representatives of a particular party, are kept in check and are prevented from uh, destroying the, the legal political system on the ground because. Uh, we, we should necessarily proceed on the assumption uh, that uh, no one in the electorate 
is, is by voting for a particular party actually votes for the destruction of democracy as such. Uh, so votes for, for the Shulkar regime. And on, on this count, I think there is no risk in, in giving more regulatory powers to the European Union by extending the scope of EU law uh, to cover more of the substance of Article 7, uh, since what the EU will be doing, it will not be substituting the national democracy. It, what it will be doing is uh, safeguarding the democratic change and, uh, and uh, safeguarding the preservation of democratic institutions in the, in the member states. And on this, it, it will not be any different uh, from, say, a functioning court system. Uh, the courts in the, in the member states of the EU are not elected, yet they are a vital element of democracy because they precisely provide the check on uh, those who are elected to make sure that they don't grab power forever, to make sure that uh, the EU is not, is, is not Putin's Russia or plenty of other examples uh, that the contemporary populist world uh, provides. Uh, to ban, that, that's also a magnificent question. And in fact, uh, this could be one of the ways of solving uh, solving our problems uh, a little bit, probably in thinking long term. And that relates to creating a, a bigger project for multi speed Europe. Europe is already multi speed, uh, but uh, in fact, progress towards uh, closer and closer. Uh, cons the concentric circles of integration, which are closer to the centers, as well. Uh, could, could be related to clear conditions and, 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 and meeting clear standards. In this sense, of course, uh, the, the, the starting point would be to monitor everybody and then uh, we would probably start with, uh, with, with a couple of old member states and then we would gradually extend. Uh, so it's basically a replication of the conditionality strategy of the, of the uh, that was deployed in the course of the pre accession and during the Big Bang enlargement. My trouble with that is that we know that the very existence of Poland and Hungary as they are today actually proves that this kind of strategies do not work. So when the, when the European Commission has, uh, has reported an overwhelming success uh, and uh, has testified to other institutions that, that Poland and Hungary are overwhelmingly, transported, are overwhelmingly transformed, they now comply with, uh, with, uh, with all the Copenhagen criteria and they're ready to join. Uh, this uh, this is something that everybody believed, uh, at least at least officially. But uh, we know that so this uh, such, such kind of testimonies cannot be taken uh, for granted, uh, and I will probably give, give a photo that turn to afterwards. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Um, we have extensively listed the instruments that are available to enforce the rule of law. Uh, there is a myriad of instruments within the EU and outside, but there are some fundamental problems with all of them, they, mainly that they are not there for enforcement. So for some of them are there for monitoring, some of them are there for benchmarking even, uh, or just highlighting the problems, um, such as the, uh, some of them are extremely soft, like the EU Justice Scoreboard, or they are just targeting certain issues, such as the cooperation on verification mechanism, or they are just targeting certain jurisdictions. So what we are left with is an Article 7 procedure, but it has extremely high political thresholds, uh, and therefore it is very difficult even to have have them triggered. Now we are talking about the, um, uh, or the literature sometimes talks about the nuclear option and how, uh, how vital it is that the procedure has been started against uh, Hungary and Poland, but bear in mind that it's an Article 7.1 procedure that has been started against these two countries, which is basically the opening of a dialogue, of a discourse between the European Union and the respective countries. So it doesn't lead to any meaningful, dissuasive, effective uh, sanctions. Um, re, uh, having, a, uh, having acknowledged uh, these difficulties arising from Article 7, uh, the Commission came up with uh, the so-called Rule of Law Framework. It's a pre-Article 7 procedure, uh, and some, some scholars like um, Dimitri himself in advance already warned the European Union that this was not going to work because, uh, because of some um, uh, uh, some some legal problems, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and in the end, uh, the uh, rule of law framework was tested vis-a-vis -vis Poland uh, with regard to its uh, 
dismantling of the independence of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. And uh, the procedure has proven that you cannot have a discursive sunshine approach with a member state which doesn't share the same vocabulary in terms of the rule of law and democracy. So what happened was that the Commission came out with very clear suggestions for Poland which were not respected by the country. Uh, the, uh, the country was given um, uh, further and further deadlines uh, to comply with the Commission's recommendations, but before the procedure even came to an end, uh, the independence of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal was gone. So, uh, against this background, there are also other attempts now to enforce, um, uh, enforce the rule of law, and here um, some, uh, there are some attempts to play around the uh, the power of the purse with the power of the purse um, and to um, and to have some monetary um, dissuasive measures uh, imposed uh, on the member states in one way or another uh, that do not comply uh, with the with the foundational values uh, of uh, of european integration so these are these are the these are the measures that we have at hand. I, there is one more uh, procedure that we haven't talked about, and these are this is the force of infringement procedures. Dimitri already mentioned uh, the certain theories uh, surrounded uh, around uh, in, infringement procedures and the academic proposals that would give a teeth uh, to infringement procedures uh, when it comes to rule of law backsliding. Uh, I also have some recommendations. First of all, call a spade a spade. So if it's a rule of law backsliding problem, just name it a rule of law backsliding problem. Don't pretend that this is a discrimination case or something like it. So it already happened in EU history and it leads nowhere. The second is uh, not to have a discursive approach with a member state that is not open uh, to, uh, to discourse. So once all pieces of evidence are there uh, to prove that there is a rule of law challenge act, also, um, um, the commission that is typically triggering an infringement procedure should acknowledge that time plays a crucial element when it comes to dismantling the, the rule of law, and time is all, always on the side of the problematic government, so uh, all procedures with a rule of law element should preferably be uh, automatically expedited or accelerated. And whenever uh, it makes sense, there also should be interim measures imposed uh, on these governments in order to, uh, to prevent them from doing further harms. Thank you very much for these further elaborations and, and, and clarifications. Um, we're running slightly behind schedule, but I think we have time for another couple of interesting questions. Um, first of all, uh, Laurent Pesch asks uh, your thoughts on the proposal by Manfred Weber, who, to remind the audience, is one of the Spitzenkandidats proposed by the, uh, in particular, by the EPP, um, uh, with regard to essentially replacing the monitoring role of the European Commission with a panel of experts and judges. Um, and what does this say with his evaluation of, of the, of the uh, Commission's ability to give an objective assessment in terms of rule of law backsliding? Um, and then we have um, a question from Carlos Hernandez Vasquez that asks you to elaborate on the link between rule of law backsliding and corruption and perhaps what the EU can, can do about this. You may go ahead. Shall I? If, if, that, um, if that fits you. I would like to start with, um, with uh, Laurent's question about um, this, this program of um, Mr. Weber. The moment I was reading this, this plan, I had the, the feeling that the, 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 the second, the third, and the fourth step that he proposes is just another step just to try to avoid saying it, that someone has a rule of law problem. It just it was extremely long idea how to do this, the things that can be done actually uh, after one meeting of, of the council, which apparently is a problem even right now because of the um, Romanian presidency has no one to, or didn't want to until last week to organize a hearing about 
and the rule of law issues in Poland and Hungary. So I have the feeling that um, the, the proposal of, of Mr. Weber is just about, uh, again, about finding uh, a new arguments, um, just not to say that someone has a rule of law problem and that it is, in fact, a new um, problem by, by itself. And I just want to have made, made one point with reference to, to the previous questions. Um, when it comes to the key EU institutions that should play the main role, as far as now, this is the court who is actually the most effective player. But I have in mind that like, the main two players would be commissioned as independent administrative body who deals with the equal application of EU law, but also member states who need to take this responsibility as well. But then I also thought about actually members of national parliaments who should be also felt responsible for what is happening with their citizens in other member states. And I, I think the, uh, the latest discussion in the Dutch parliament that took place two months ago shows how much the national MPs really need this kind of information and update about what is happening with the rule of law in Hungary, in Poland, because Dutch citizens will also have to face also jurisdictions of those countries. Um, and that's why I, I guess uh, this also is a moment when member states may decide actually to initiate proceedings based on 259 um, Treaty of, of Functioning of the EU and par parliamentarians, so the active politicians, might be in fact um, in a major um, player in the field. Can I continue immediately? <clears throat> to, to build on this, I agree with all the points basically, especially in, in Getting the national parliament on board. Uh, to build on this, we have to say that it's impossible to expect much uh, from the council because the council, uh, the, the council is uh, part of the large design. The large design is about ensuring that the member states coexist in a non-confrontational way. That's why that's why Article 259 uh, has not been used thoughtfully. In fact, uh, really regrettably for Article 259 for all of us, but probably. This is also a good sign because, uh, because it shows that the internal market function has designed. And what I mean by that is that the genre the, the, is that the method is about ensuring full infiltration of national economies to make uh, to make sure that uh, besides prosperity, uh, uh, prosperity and uh, a common uh, area of, of opportunities, we also have peace. The war is impossible. Confrontation is impossible. One there is one there is full infiltration. And Article Seven goes against all what the IT has to say about the uh, about the role of interpretation, the way how the EU is designed and functions. Uh, because Article Seven asks for asks for sanctions, basically, and this is something that uh, the members of the Council will not be uh, eager to support, no matter basically, no unless there is a new Hitler, uh, there is someone called the Hitler provision uh, in place. Why? Because uh, because any kind of move against Poland or against Hungary will obviously harm the politicians back home. All the companies of all the member states benefiting from what the, what the internal market has to offer, investing in Hungary, uh, so the, is, is, is establishing that, will obviously be harmed uh, by, by this kind of action. So it's highly unlikely that anything good will, will come out of the council. That's, that's precisely why uh, we look at the court. And I would like to, to take the corruption question. Uh, this is this is really this is really one of the core problems that the EU has to has to tackle, but uh, it's 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 unclear how much it's actually related to backsliding as such. I think the relation is not is is is, is, is not crucial and is not is not fundamental. So if, if backsliding is is a is an attempt to to violate the rule of law in order to decapacitate de democracy and state power virtually forever, uh, then of course harnessing the state resources uh, will, will, will result in systemic corruption, etc. But if the state is simply not well organized, uh, then uh, and if, corruption is, if corruption is part of day-to-day -day life, then of course it is a problem, but this is, it's not necessarily related uh, to capturing state institutions in order to abuse political, political power uh, to, to, freeze, uh, to, to free democratic change. And on this, there is, a, there is a wonderful contribution by Michael Yanidis in, in, in the book which I edited with Professor Yaka, where he looks at Greece as a, as a state that has deep, deep problems in terms of basically functioning as a, as a, as a, as a 
as, 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 as a successful member state of the European Union. I'm not speaking about the economic crisis, I'm speaking about a lying, lying about its own budget when Germany became new, about, the, by the way, how the whole of the court uh, system runs, etc. And obviously, we cannot say that Greece is captured in any way as similar to Poland or Hungary, but uh, obviously, corruption is a big problem. So we need to draw this uh, fine distinction line between corruption as a tool for capturing a state and thus violating all the values of Article 7, and corruption as simply uh, uh, a bad fellow of mismanagement and, uh, and maladministration. Obviously, um, <clears throat> the proposal by Manfred Weber is something uh, various scholars in this conversation today, including Professor Pesh, but also Professor Kelema and Professor Jan Werner Muller and ourselves. We have uh, came up with a proposal uh, that is very similar in some respects uh, and that has a, a commission at the heart that is doing the contextual analysis of member states on a regular basis. Uh, but also because uh, they do not give credit, um, Udo Di Fabio and Manfred Weber, to the, um, to the other political institutions that came up with this proposal first, such as the European Parliament itself. Uh, there are also some novel elements in their proposal, uh, which make it even more uh, worrisome from a substantive point of view, namely that once uh, there is a condemnation of the given member state by the Court of Justice, the proposed sanctions by the Court of Justice could be lifted by political institutions. And this simply goes against uh, the spirit of, uh, uh, of proportionate, dissuasive and effective sanctions against the member state. And it doesn't, um, seemingly the authors of the proposal doesn't really grasp the uh, constitutional constellation uh, of uh, the European Union's legal fabric or for some political reasons they do not want uh, to acknowledge it. So uh, the proposal is very some from a number of perspectives and unfortunately it's taking away uh, from the edge of the original proposals and is rendering the original proposals irrelevant. Okay, thank you very much. This is all the time we have for today. Um, we're running slightly late on our schedule, so thank you to the audience for still uh, being with us. We um, would like now to thank our speakers, Professor Petra Bard, Professor Dmitry Kochanov, and Dr. Barbara Grabowska. Moritz, as well as our audience for taking part in this webinar. Before leaving you, I would like to just announce a few um, future Reconnect activities. The next webinar is planned for the 22nd of May with Stephanie Lemke and Joel Grogan entitled Fighting Backlashes to Judicial Independence in Europe, the role of international organizations in holding Europe's judges to account. This will be followed by another webinar on June 7th with Carolina Plescia and James Wilhelm, entitled EU Citizens and the European Elections, Findings from the Reconnect Citizens Survey, where the first Reconnect empirical study will be presented. Once again, if you are in the Brussels area, on the 5th of July, we are organizing our yearly Reconnect conference, where we will share the first findings of our project and take stock of recent developments in European democracy and rule of law. For further information, please visit our website at reconnect-europe.eu. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will join us again next time. From Petra, Dimitri, Barbara, and myself, thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>